Good evening. Thank you. I'm Arian Mack, professor of psychology at the New School for Social Research, director of the New Center for Public Scholarship, and editor of the uh, journal Social Research, which has been the journal of the New School for Social Research since 1934. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's event, which we've organized in collaboration with the Institute of International Education's Scholar Rescue Fund. Unfortunately, but probably not too surprisingly, I have to begin by making a, uh, announcing a bit of bad news. We have lost Senator Leahy to the budget crisis. I'm sure you'll understand that he felt he had to be in D.C. in the hope that there might be a vote on the budget before the day is out, and I'm sure we're glad he's there, too. The good news, though, is that we have two people who will speak instead, both of whom are well known for the important work they've done and do on protecting endangered scholars around the globe. Alan Goodman, president of uh, IIE, and Rob Quinn, head of Scholars at Risk. A word about the origin of tonight's event. In 2007, in response to the first wrongful imprisonment in Iran of one of our colleagues, Kian Tajbash, and the political sentencing and imprisonment of one of our alumni, uh, I guess, in Ethiopia, uh, Berhanu Nega, Social research initiated a campaign on behalf of our endangered colleagues and at the same time introduced a new section of the journal devoted to alerting our readers to the plight of imprisoned and threatened scholars around the world and asking our readers to join us in protesting on their behalf. Our mission recalls the work of the New School's first president, Alvin Johnson, who in 1933 initiated the historic effort to res rescue scholars and intellectuals from the ravages of Nazism in Europe. Some of those refugees became the founding scholars of the university in exile and con constituted what became the graduate faculty and now called the New School for Social Research. In 2008, on the energy generated by the Endangered Scholars Worldwide initiative, and to commemorate, more importantly, the 75th anniversary of the founding of the University in Exile, the new school established a University in Exile Scholar in Residence Fellowship. This is a one to two year fellowship which provides an endangered scholar with a safe academic home here at the New School, and we are doing this in collaboration with the Scholar Rescue Fund. A word about Scholar Rescue Fund. The Scholar Rescue Fund was initiated in 2002 under the auspices of the Institute of International Education, that is IIE. Scholar Rescue Fund provides uh, fellowships for established scholars whose lives and works are threatened in their home country. These fellowships permit professors and researchers and other senior academics to find temp temporary refuge, refuge at universities and colleges around the world, enabling them to pursue their academic work and continue teaching whenever possible and sharing their knowledge with students, colleagues, and the community at large. Since they began working, and this is impressive, the Scholar Rescue Fund has assisted 392 scholars. We are very pleased to work with them. Just before I turn over the microphone now to David Van Zant, let me just say my own word of welcome to Alan Goodman, of IIE, Rob Quinn of Scholars at Risk, Jonathan Fanton, former president of the New School and of the MacArthur Foundation, and the scholars who are here with us tonight. It's now my great pleasure to turn the microphone over to the still very new New School president, David Van Zant. Okay. I was going to say more. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Erin, and welcome to all of you um, this evening uh, to our Scholars in Residence uh, uh, event. Um, as Arian mentioned, certainly he couldn't be here, but I think it's our great fortune uh, to, he to have two speakers to replace him 
um, who you wouldn't have heard if suddenly he'd shown up. So I think we're, I think we're blessed by that. But um, I do want to start out by thanking the, the Institute of International Education for co-sponsoring this program tonight and uh, for all the work it does with, with the Scholars Rescue Fund. It's certainly part of the core of what the New School has done throughout its history, and it's wonderful to have a, a partner for such a long time in doing this, uh, doing this important work. Well, let me start out by introducing our, 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 two our first of our two speakers. Uh, he is uh, Dr. Alan E. Goodman. He is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Institute of International Education. He was previously the Executive Dean um, of the School of Foreign Service and a professor at Georgetown University. He is author of several books on international affairs. He has served uh, as the Presidential Briefing Coordinator for the Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And he served as special assistant to the director of National Foreign Assessment Center in the Carter administration. He was the first American professor to lecture at the Foreign Affairs College of Beijing. And he helped create the first US academic exchange program with the Moscow Diplomatic Ac Ac Academy for the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. He currently serves as a consultant to the Ford Foundation, the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, um, the USIA, United States Information Agency, and IBM, and he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Alan? It's always a pleasure to see the difference that a new president makes. Uh, I really like the flowers. I don't remember roses on the stage before, uh, but uh, Dave, we're really thrilled that you're here in New York. Uh, the weather is a lot warmer than Chicago. Uh, uh, I am a graduate of Northwestern. I am sure they are missing you every day, but Arian and all the faculty and students here are fortunate to have you as a great new leader. Uh, many years ago at a commencement that was made famous by its speaker, England's poet laureate, uh, John Macefield, said, there are few earthly things more beautiful than a university. And he never went to a university. He was getting an honorary degree from Manchester, and later President Kennedy uh, spoke, about the, spoke the same words when he gave his famous speech at American University. And I've always been drawn to Macefield's text, not because universities are necessarily beautiful places, though this is a beautiful auditorium and a wonderful school. I was drawn to it because if you read the rest of what he said, what makes them beautiful is not their architecture, but that they welcome thinkers in distress and in exile. And that is the mission that uh, the new school has and has had for all its life, and it's a mission that, that we share. And when we started rescuing scholars in the 1930s, it was to the new school we turned uh, as a place in America that could take more than one or two at a time, and it became uh, your graduate faculty. What's striking about the history we share and the mission we share is that it's still needed today. Uh, we now have processed over 2,000 applications by scholars from over 100 countries that are in some difficulty because of civil war, terrorism, criminal activities, repressive regimes, or repressive officials. And every time outside of New York in the new school that I mentioned this number, most academics say we had no idea. And it is a sad commentary on our world and our profession that we still have to find places for thinkers in distress and in exile. And we are very blessed that one of those places is here at, at your school, and that you have both a history of doing this and a contemporary interest. We're grateful for the home, Arian, that you provided for uh, a scholar now for two years, and uh, one of your donors uh, is continuing. Uh, these statements are ways of saving individual lives that uh, someday could make a huge difference. Uh, with the scholars that we rescued in the 30s, uh, 12 Nobel Prizes got won. The MRI was invented. 
uh, scientific knowledge was advanced. And who of us today is able to think that the life we save today might be the person who invents a cure for cancer or a vaccine for HIV and AIDS? Uh, you never know whose life you save may save us all. And that's the essence of scholar rescue. Every life has value, and if you save one life, sometimes you save all of humanity. It's an honor for me to represent uh, our institute and Senator Leahy and his interests in Scholar Rescue. That, uh, and it's an honor for our board members, some of whom are in the audience. Uh, members of the board, I see Fred Tarter. I, we saw Tom Russo earlier. I don't know if Henry Jarecki has joined us. Uh, he's waving his hand. Uh, these board members almost once a month meet to discuss the cases of scholars uh, that have applied to us for help. It's that much work, and it's work now thanks to the fund that will continue. So Dave and Arian, thank you so much for having me and, and honoring the Institute and the Rescue with your partnership. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, uh, Robert Quinn. Uh, Robert is the founding executive director of the Scholars at Risk Network based at NYU. He currently serves on the steering committee of the Network for Education and Academic Rights based in London, the governing council of the Magna Charta Observatory based in Bologna, Italy, and a fellow with the Woodrow Wilson Visiting Fellows Program in Washington, D.C. Previously, um, Robert had a close connection uh, with our event tonight, uh, serving as the executive director of the Institute's uh, International Education Scholar Rescue, uh, Rescue Fund. He is a member of the, of the Committee on Scientific Freedom and Responsibility of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a member of the Human Rights Committee of the Association of the Bar of the City of New York, and he is currently the Joseph Crowley Fellow in International Human Rights and an adjunct professor of law at Fordham Law School. Join me in uh, welcoming uh, Robert. Robert. We few, we happy few. Does anyone recognize those words? We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. They're from the, Saint, the climax of young Henry V's St. Crispin's Day speech on the eve of the Battle of Agincourt as penned by Shakespeare. Hopelessly outnumbered and, outnumbered and cut off from supplies, the young Henry summons the courage to face the forces of darkness before him by noting how rare and how precious is the opportunity to be one of the few who stands up against impossible odds. I like this quote because it symbolizes for me what a rare and precious opportunity it is to have access to higher education, any higher education, let alone a great institution like the New School. We few, we happy few, all of us who have had this opportunity to go to university are the happy few. Six billion people on earth today do not have this opportunity. We happy few indeed. What do we do with this opportunity? We better ourselves for our own enrichment and personal gain, of course. We learn to go out into the world and have a better life at whatever profession or vocation we choose. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But there's a second answer also, beyond personal gain. With the opportunity comes a responsibility to contribute to social good. This responsibility stems from the fact that access is still such a rare privilege. This responsibility stems from the fact that universities and indeed knowledge itself are socially constructed. Everything, everything that we learn and discover builds on the knowledge and discoveries of the generations who have come before us. These prior generations and those that come after us have a right to call on us to contribute to this ongoing process of building the social good. In practice, I think most of us try to balance these two, personal gain and social good. The challenge, the challenge arises when the two conflict, 
when demands of social good create risks for our personal gain. What would we do then? Would we have the courage to use our education, to use our academic freedom, to think, even when it might harm us? That is what the scholars you are going to hear from tonight have done. Each of them has had the courage to think, to serve the social good, even when it put them at risk. And that is what the hundreds of scholars helped each year by the Scholars at Risk Network, by the Scholar Rescue Fund, and our partners and friends worldwide do every day. Scholars at Risk works to support individuals like them. Scholars at Risk is a network of universities. We currently have more than 250 members in 30 countries. And our main activity is to arrange temporary opportunities for scholars like those you will hear from tonight to live and work in safety, to escape the dangers at home, and to continue living out the courage of their ideas. Many more are helped in other ways, including referrals for legal or other services, nominations for jobs and fellowships, and advocacy for those in prison. And increasingly, we bring services to the scholars' home countries through workshops and trainings and advocacy aimed at improving conditions for academic freedom and university values everywhere. We're delighted that the New School is an early and leading member of our network. And of course, given your history, how could we expect otherwise? I'm delighted for the opportunity to work with President Van Zandt, with Arian, with everyone here at the New School. And of course, equally delighted to work with all of our friends and partners at the Scholar Rescue Fund, which is the single largest source of support uh, for threatened scholars. Now, as we listen to the scholars here tonight, I want to remind you that they represent more than just individual cases of courage and integrity, although they are certainly that. Each also represents a model, a window into a better world, one shaped by the courage to think. Through their eyes, through their courage, we find the path to this better world. And what does that world look like? It's one where difficult questions and disputes are resolved not by violence, but by discourse, evidence, reason, debate. In other words, by quality. This is the unique contribution of the higher education sector, and these scholars remind us of it. Higher education communities are engines of democratic life. They impart not only skills and knowledge necessary for a more prosperous life. They infuse in society a deep appreciation for what I call the quality over force principle. This principle says that inside this space, the physical space of the campus and the conceptual spaces of discourse in democratic society, we do not use violence or force to get our way. In other words, as one scholar said it to me, we leave our guns at the door. Each of the scholars here tonight is an example of when this quality over force principle was violated. They sacrificed greatly to uphold the essential function of the university. And by defending them and the hundreds like them, we honor their sacrifices and remind ourselves of our role in promoting quality over force every day. They remind us that we, too, have to have the courage to think. That means, first and foremost, the courage to take full advantage of our access to higher education, not only for our own gain, but to contribute to social good. The courage to think means the courage to question, to ask the kinds of probing, thoughtful, fair-minded questions that we've been trained in our higher education experience to ask and expect. It means the courage to listen, to listen to answers to thoughtful questions, and to listen also for gaps in answers. It means not being passive or complicit in being misled or lied to. It means the courage to listen to information and opinions even and perhaps especially when we don't agree with them, presuming they are brought forth in forth, uh, thoughtful and serious ways. The courage to think means the courage to hold oneself open to compelling evidence and argument, and even the courage to change one's views when presented with such information. The courage to think means the courage to defend the space for inquiry, expression, and debate free from violence and force. I mean the physical space, and also the conceptual space in our hearts and minds and in our relations with others. It means the courage to defend the quality over force principle 
not only when our views and those like ours are being aired, we need to be willing to welcome into the space anyone who is willing to join us in the process of inquiry, evidence, reason, discourse, and quality. Most of all, the courage to think means the courage to face repercussions for our ideas. Academic freedom, free inquiry, free expression are not the same as freedom from criticism. Now, of course, I'm not talking about the violent types of attack that the, the scholars helped by scholars at risk and the scholar at rescue funds suffer. But we have an obligation to accept and offer critiques of our colleagues' work, but to do so in ways that honor the best traditions of the university space. When we do so, when we model the values of the university as a space and leave violence and force outside, we are role models for our students, our peers, and for society at large. Since the original university exile was established here decades ago, the world has seen revolutionary changes, changes that make the courage to think more important today than perhaps ever before. Traditional filters for quality, information, the costs of reproduction, and the limited number of experts, these are gone. All of us who have had the rare opportunity of higher education need to step into this void. All of us need to have the courage to use our education, to use our academic freedom, to think. We need to be producers of filters of quality information in society by asking questions, listening, and being open to debate. And we need to help others to do the same. We need to risk respectful disagreement and risk being unpopular for it. We need to risk confrontation in defense of knowledge and truth without resorting to coercion and force. We may need to risk our personal gain in favor of social good. If we take up this challenge, we honor the sacrifices of the scholars you will hear tonight and many more around the world who still need our help. When we accept this responsibility to engage with people, information, opinions, realities and truth, justices and injustices as we see them with intellectual and emotional honesty, even when doing so carries risks, we take full advantage of our education and become engines of social good. When we willingly and seriously accept this responsibility, then we join those like the scholars here tonight who are every day living the courage to think. We few, we happy few. Thank you, um, thank you Robert, uh, for those remarks. And, and again, thank you to both Alan and Robert for um, doing such a great job on such short notice. I think it's about two hours. Uh, that was tremendous. That was tremendous. Well, uh, it's my, my um, great pleasure to welcome back uh, someone to the new school, um, Jonathan Fan. Uh, he's one of my predecessors as president, and we are very fortunate to have him here tonight as, as um, a moderator for our panel. Uh, the new school, as you've heard and as you know, has a long history of working with, uh, with endangered scholars um, all over the world. But I think it's, it's fair to say that Jonathan, during his presidency, uh, revived and redirected and really refocused the attentions of the new school on this issue. And what we see before us today, we owe a lot to him in terms of what he was able to do as, as, um, as president. Jonathan served as a new school sixth president from 1982 to 1999. Uh, and under his leadership, the school grew, grew significantly. But it also maintained its principles of academic freedom and human rights. In 1984, the new school awarded honor, an honorary degree uh, to the famous Polish dissident, Adam Michnik, who was imprisoned at the time. In 1990, um, the Central Europe program was established. It helped Polish, uh, Hungarian, and Czech intellectuals fighting for political change in their countries. Today, we call it the Trans-Regional Center for De Democratic Studies and is doing, trying to do the same thing throughout the world. Jonathan has been engaged with Human, Human Rights Watch and served uh, as the chair of its board from 1998 to 2003. When he left the presidency here in 1998-99, he moved on to the, uh, to the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation out uh, in the city of Chicago, um, where he was president uh, for, that, for that period. 
And currently, he is the inaugural Franklin Delano uh, Roosevelt Visiting Fellow at Roosevelt House, the Public Policy Institute at Hunter College. Jonathan, it's great to have you back at the Thank New you. School, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that gracious introduction, and thank you and uh, Arian for inviting me to participate in this uh, important event that evokes the New School's enduring commitment to assisting scholars at risk. I want to say that I'm very pleased to have in David Van Zant a successor who understands and will advance the core values of the New School. And David, by all accounts, you're off to a great start and you can count on my help and support uh, any way I can be useful to you. Through all of its history, going back to 1919, the New School has understood that a vibrant democratic uh, society depends on academic freedom. Ask yourself this simple question. Can you think of any authoritarian regime that allows genuine academic freedom anywhere in the world? Or the reverse. Can we think of a democracy which is not nourished by strong and independent universities? Our fight for academic freedom is the critical path to free, open, democratic societies. But we know progress is often slow, incremental, step by step, scholar by scholar. But even in the darkest hours, Scholars who escape repression and live in exile keep hope alive, shine the light of truth on their home countries, and stand as a symbol of a better future. Their courage inspires their fellow citizens. Their scholarship and their stories fire our commitment to help. And when they return home in safety, the world will know that it is time to invest intellectual professional and financial resources in their homelands.